Hello, welcome to CMS. So if Hello. you'd like to give the, the initial words or if you want us to start. Oh, yeah, you want to start. Just go ahead. Okay, so welcome to CMS. Behi behind us, you see a submarine. No, I'm just kidding. I'll tell you what it is uh, in uh, during the, the visit. And with me, it's Nikos, Hello. who is also... Uh, will will be your guide throughout this, this visit. Uh, he will be going downstairs to the CMS experiment with uh, Noemi, who is uh, who, who has been mastering this, uh, who has been owning this uh, uh, virtual visits from from day one. And uh, in front of me, you cannot see him, unfortunately. I, I but uh, I really count on his existence. It's Zoltan, who knows deep information about CMS, and uh, when I I don't feel alone when he's around. Uh, so we will basically talk about several aspects of the detector of, of LHC, what we are doing here. And uh, at any moment, please don't hesitate to uh, to interrupt and to put uh, put into questions. Nico, do you have anything to add right now? Or uh, no, that's that's it for me as well. You did a very good introduction. Okay, so let's start. So fantastic. Uh, as said, any, at any moment, please do not uh, hesitate to shoot questions. Uh, so maybe we can start with the screen. So where we are? We are in France, actually. You can see the border between Switzerland and France. Uh, we are on the, the French side of the LHC ring. You can see the big LHC ring of 27 kilometers of diameter. Uh, sorry, of, of circumference. Uh, and you can see the four big experiments on the on the LHC, uh, we we are the CMS experiment, one of the two multi-purpose experiments of LHC, which covers multiple physics aspects, and you also have Alice and LHCb, which covers uh, specific physics calls. LHCb uh, is looking for uh, uh, matter antimatter asymmetry, the, uh, why the CP is is violated, etc. Alice is looking for heavy ion collisions, trying to look for um, um, for uh, quark gluon plasma that is supposed to be existing in the in the in the very very early time of of the universe. And Atlas is is like CMS. It's it's also a multi multi purpose detector, which covers basically the the physics calls of LHCb and Alice as well. So LHC is built in in a tunnel which was already used for the pre previous accelerator, the LEP, the Electron-Positron Collider. And behind me, what I was show showing and saying that it's a submarine, it's, it's in fact a, a radio frequency ca cavern for, for cavity for the electrons for the previous accelerator. For LHC, it's the same principle, but it's a bit bigger. Maybe we can show it on the other side of the room. Uh, Zoltan says, no, we cannot access to that. So sad, it's, it's like... A, three times bigger and it's a bit more sophisticated but it's the same principle so you have uh, layers of uh, of uh, metal through which the particles pass and you have uh, alternating uh, voltage that uh, allows the, the particles uh, to be accelerated the charged particles ah, now ah, he managed so this is this is the one from from LHC basically a bit more complex and with the with the company name on it so uh CMS is is uh, so, so you can uh, yeah I can show you the experiments uh, basically the CMS experiment uh, what we call it is it's like a cylindrical onion so it has layers of different um, de detectors of different technologies in the in the heart of the detector where the collision happened so, right. Yeah. Uh, so in the, in the heart of the detector, you can see uh, the silicon detectors uh, right next to the point of, of collision. I, I think you can see the mouse, right? As Alton confirms. So great. yes, it's also clear. Okay, so this is the collision point. So the the two two beams come from from uh, different directions, like 100 meters below my feet, more or less, and. Uh, they meet each other in the in the heart of the, the detector, 40 million times a second. And then the, the particles emerge in, in all directions. And the aim of this uh, camera, of this huge camera, is to uh, trap as much as possible the outgoing 
particles from the collisions to be able to measure them uh, properly. So the inner part, the, the silicon tracker, aims to measure the momentum. Uh, thanks to the solenoid magnet, we have a huge magnetic field in the volume that uh, bends the, 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 the trajectories of the particles and with which we can, we can extract the momentum. Then we have the calorimeters, the electromagnetic calorimeter and the hydronic calorimeter, which in common measures the energies of the particles. They, they trap the particles inside and by measuring the, the sort of the light that comes out of this, uh, we can correlate it to the energy of the incoming particle. And finally, this, the detectors that gives the name to our detector, uh, the muon system is, is on the outermost shell. The muon is the heavy brother of electrons. You can think of 200 times heavier than the electron, which means it has a, a finite lifetime, but it's, it's long enough for it to, to traverse all the detector. But also it can, in fact, reach from the upper parts of the atmosphere. They can be produced and it can travel all the way and it can uh, uh, give signal in the CMS detector 100 meters down, the, uh, down into the earth. That is really impressive. Right. Uh, and it, it, it's in fact a, a probe to uh, to prove that the, the special relativity works, because if you don't take into account uh, the time delay, uh, the, the lifetime of the muons wouldn't be enough to reach the the surface. But we know that they we see we see them. So it's a uh, it's one of the proofs of uh, of uh, the, the concept of uh, of the special relativity. So the detector is also detecting cosmic rays. Exactly, and we are using them because they are straight lines, uh, almost straight lines, that we can use to align sort of uh, the, the exact position of our detectors. We want to know the exact position of the tracker with respect to the others, so we can use them as, as probes through all the directions coming I mean, from top to bottom, obviously, and uh, we can use it to, to properly know the, the the exact positions of the either groups of detectors or as a whole the whole tracker so how was cms built so if you have any questions and meanwhile i see that noemi and uh, nico are in the control room maybe i can give the word over hello can you hear me testing audio <laughs> Loud and clear. Okay, perfect. So uh, this is uh, where I'm at now is the CMS control room. So this is uh, where we basically while taking data, we have to make sure that the detector and every part of its systems is working correctly. So you see there are a lot of screens here and every, every seat has basically a different role. So for example, the, the occupied seat that Nemi is uh, focusing on right now is the shift leader. He, he is the, let's say, master of the data taking. He decides when we start taking and when we're not. The other occupied seat on the other side is the technical sister. He takes care of, uh, basically, he looks at all the conditions in the detector, all the alarms, and makes sure that nothing goes wrong, as well as the safety systems. And uh, we have a big uh, futuristic uh, status panel here. And if there's something wrong, we always see it in uh, a red light. So currently we're, uh, we're slowly restarting. So it's normal that we have a few errors. At some point in the next week or two, this is, these are gonna go away and we'll be back to taking data. So not, all, I, not all of the reds disappear, right, Nico? Uh, well, it depends on what's the status. Usually it's supposed to be all green, but yeah. <laughs> these red ones are <laughs> for, for now, yes, when we're taking data, it's. Uh, debatable. <laughs> well, for sure, okay, the magnet the, magnet current. Yeah, the, be, the magnet current is the one that stays red because the magnet needs to be on. So yeah, this one this one stays on. <laughs> so when are you planning ah. to turn the CMS magnet on again? So actually, we uh, we were uh, doing ramping tests uh, right now. So the a ramping test was done yesterday, and from tomorrow we're going to start uh, turning it on uh, fully. Is that right? So from tomorrow we're turning it on. Yeah. Okay, so from tomorrow the magnet will be on. Right. So you are uh, you are actually very lucky because this is one of the last I think visits for this uh, year in shutdown. So in uh, 
a week or two, the LHC is going to start up again and there will be no one allowed in the caverns anymore. So you're really lucky this is happening now. Thank you so much. It really is an amazing opportunity. We're really excited to see it. Yeah, no problem. So I will hand it back to Bugra and we can head uh, underground. Thanks. So yes, passing from the control room to, to the assembly hall once again. So as... Um, as I have already said, this is the assembly hall. Basically, if Sultan can show the other side of the of the room to, to my right, you will see a huge uh, hangar, uh, a hall where the, the CMS was, was put together. I think unlike Atlas, it was put on the surface altogether. Atlas for Atlas, it was not the case. So our detector was, was built in this room. And uh, later on, uh, through the, the shaft that you see on my left, each piece, each slide of it, it's it's designed in, in, in slices. So each slice of it was uh, brought down using a stronger um, uh, crane because the ones that we have, they cannot uh, handle it. Uh, okay. Each piece is something like... Yes, Nico, do you want to show the access system? Yeah, just, uh, yeah I'm waiting right. here so I can show you uh, yeah. how the access system in Go the ahead. LAT works. So... Well, usually at CERN, when you enter, you pass a door that is protected. Usually, it just have to access to access you with your card. So you have your card; it knows who you are. You badge it says, "Okay." The door says, "Okay, you have access. Go in." But uh, when it comes to uh, big, expensive experiments like this, you need to be a bit more, uh, uh, let's say, strict in who can go in. So while I do have my card, usually I can give it to someone else, and they can go in on my behalf. So we need to make sure that only people that actually have access can go in. So this system right behind me is, uh, well, in order to go in, first I have to scan my dosimeter, as you will see. Then I will have to go in and pass through a biometry check, which by biometry check, we mean they will scan the retina of my eye. And if it matches the image that they took when I started working at CERN, it will let me in. If not, it will kick me out. So let's see. Fingers, fingers oh, crossed. And by the way, for those who wear glasses, you are a bit unlucky that you usually have to take all your off your glasses, otherwise it doesn't look in. And I'm in. Congratulations. <laughs> this really is futuristic. So it I, must I, be I, like agents. Have you seen the movie of uh, from the book of Dan Brown? They were they were really emphasizing this. Has anyone else seen it? I can pick one or two people on the crowd. So Nico, I leave the bird for you until you reach the elevator, then you will lose the connection. So I will use yeah. that moment to, to finish my bird for the for descending the yeah. CMS and, uh, to where you are going. Yeah, and uh, you can see now the elevator. So the elevator is currently at the lowest level, minus 97 meters, and I'm gonna call it up right now. Takes a minute, right? A bit more than a minute to come up. Yeah. I, actually, when while I'm doing visits, the most interesting question I get is, what's the velocity of the elevator? And to be honest, I have no clue. A couple of meters per second, I guess, like one meter per second. Yeah, I mean, 60 seconds to go to come and 90 meters, so one and a half. I do have a question. I think uh, I remember the... Um... The ground um, uh, down at the CMS is not flat, so you are not entirely at the same level um, under the earth the whole time. So there, there is some sort of inclination. For so LHC, you mean? Like, mm -hmm. like in other access points, okay, there are different, uh, different depths. Like, uh, yes. yeah. So is I that on purpose? No, it's just because of the uh, the structure of the land of the of the land that uh, you had to go down to to a specific point where you had the a specific uh, component to be able to build mm -hmm. the tunnel because the tunnel is is not super new. Right? It was built uh, in uh, for the previous accelerator, so they had to really optimize uh, things with the technology back then. All right, I understand. Yeah. So now I think we will lose uh, the connection from the elevator as always. So yes, what I was telling is that the CMS was was built here. It was even taking data with the beautiful cosmic muons, and we could even publish a paper from from that, measuring the the energy deposit of the particles in in the detector. 
and each slice of it was brought down using a strong crane down uh, into the experimental cavern through the big shaft, which is now closed because we are in, in the mode of, uh, of of data taking. And as you can see, maybe on the picture on the left, if Sultan can uh, can project that. I mean the the picture of the the, the detector. Sorry, yeah. sorry. Yes. Yep. So uh, you see the actual size of the detector, okay, let's and yeah. uh, yeah, give me thirty seconds, Nico, and I will give it yeah, give yeah. over to you. No so you can have the feeling of the the size of a slice of CMS that was uh, lower down through the shaft that is just. I mean, beneath these uh, red uh, shieldings that we have uh, brand new. Uh, and it, for each piece, it took something like 10 to 12 hours to, to lower it down because you didn't want to have a pendulum due to gravity that it could hit the wall of the, the shaft. So it was a delicate process. It's back to you, Nico. Yeah, so yeah, just to add on to that, that uh, I don't know if it was mentioned earlier where the connection was cut off, is that the entire CMS weighs about 14,000 tons. That's like one and a half Eiffel Towers. And uh, if you think that there's 12 slices, each slice is about 1,000 tons, aka three 747Zs. So if you want to think in big numbers about how much each slice of CMS weighs. Yeah, and, I, I, uh... I left the numbers <laughs> to you. I didn't tell it. <laughs> Okay, so currently we're basically right at the entrance of the cavern, and you can see we have one of the shafts, and uh, we're about uh, 87 meters, I think, if I saw the elevator correctly, underground, and uh, the, the lead strips you can see is just basically a visual indicator of the data flowing from the CMS cavern underground to uh, our computing centers that is on, uh, on the ground level. But it doesn't re reflect the speed, right? It's just the demonstration. Yeah, no, no, it, it does not reflect the speed. And right the now we're not much faster. data, so it's uh, it's yeah. just like uh, yeah, it's just for uh, display purposes. Hopefully, <laughs> Zoltan is <laughs> crossing fingers in front of me for the speed. <laughs> so, so now they're entering. Yeah, so I guess since we're already here and talking about data and electronics. This is one of the computer rooms uh, underground. So, all right, I said I'm, uh, during the introduction, I'm the computer scientist here. And uh, well, we can talk a lot about data. Let's actually go to the trigger systems. So the things about uh, particle detectors and particle physics in general, you have a lot of data. When I say a lot of data, if you connect out everywhere from CMS to computer and say, please record me everything you see, you end up with like uh, 70, no, it was, I think, 40 terabytes per second. So your computer has what? One, two, four terabytes of storage. So 40 terabytes per second is a number very much impossible to store in any, in any physical computer system. So the first task that we have to do once we start getting data is actually filter it. And we have to decide which data we want to keep, which data we don't want to keep. And this gets a bit more complicated when you imagine the scale of uh, 40 terabytes per second, and uh, which means that the system has to take the data at 40 terabytes per second and make the decision. Because if it does not, we are starting to build up a backlog. And at some point, uh, we are going to start losing data because our computers are not fast enough to process the data coming in. So as you can imagine, you probably know that means there's a lot of optical fibers and a lot of very interesting electronics, let's say. So uh, in the computer room here, we have, well, as you see optical fibers, the blue cables are mostly optical fibers coming from the detector. And they're plugged in into uh, these controllers. They are basically, we call them FPGAs. Those of you that work with, uh, I don't know, people with, from Sunride and so on should know what FPGAs are. Uh, they're basically field programmable gate arrays. So they are hardware hardware processors that we can program on the go. So they are not they are not computer processors because computer processors run instructions of software. With FPGAs, with hardware processors, we get to actually reprogram the gates themselves. So instead of writing computer code, like take one, add one, uh, multiply that by two, we say take two wires, connect, connect them together, add the transistor, or add, add the end gate, an OR gate, and so on. So it's like 
programming, but programming in circuits instead of programming in instructions. And uh, you can see the sign here. So this is what we call the trigger system. So all the data, data passes through here. And this system is the one that decides, is this interesting or is this not interesting? And all of, all of this process is done in few microseconds, just to uh, yes. highlight. So That's yeah, why we need to... these, uh, this circuit. Yeah, just to say that we have one collision inside our detector every 25 nanoseconds, which means the processing of each event needs to be 25 nanoseconds or less. Otherwise, we start losing data. Yeah, but then then you have the buffers, which allows you to, which gives yeah, you uh, some time for the for the level one, yeah. which is uh, order of the order of microseconds. Yeah, the, the, yeah. The mm. problem as well, though, the problem with buffer is if you're slow consistently, you fill them up. Exactly, so, and then you create so-called peak yeah. pressure. You have so the average rate of processing has to be twenty-five nanoseconds or less. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't we don't want to be blind uh, to to new collisions. You want to digest yeah. them get them flowing so exactly. I, I i i didn't catch if you talked about the the average size of per second that comes that's the throughput so, yeah yeah i said it's like 40 terabytes per second of uh, right. of throughput out of the detector and uh, after we do all the processing and limiting the actual output rate from cms to our data center is about two five gigabytes per second maximum not more yeah. So we are limit. You are limiting severely the amount of data that we store, in order to actually be able to store them and analyze them in any meaningful time frame. Indeed. So I I will hand it back to you, and we can head a bit okay. further in, I guess. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So I was planning to show you the the timeline of 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 LHC, but uh, I I didn't manage to do it yet. So let's postpone it to the next round. And meanwhile, maybe. Since we were talking about the uh, the data taking, I can show you some uh, uh, some uh, uh, event displays from from CMS. If uh, meanwhile, maybe they're, they're, yeah, and meanwhile on the on the background, you see them walking to the second access point. Um, so th th as I explained, this is what we see actually. What when when to 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 particles collide at the heart of the detector. There are traces of stuff everywhere. You can see the, the muon particles here, the two red lines. You have, you can see... Um, yeah. Uh, Just, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, sorry because you had the access. Yet, no, 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 that's, by that's the, fine. By the way, yeah, this is the same access system as before, but actually this is my first time I'm going in an automatic or restricted uh, uh, mode. So <laughs> what this means is basically we are close to restarting the accelerator. So we want to be very sure that no one is in there. So the difference here is that once I badge, this is going to give me a key. And the catch is that the, any system in the LHC cannot turn on until the key is returned. So, oh, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Turn and pull, right? <laughs> so you have to catch the, the key as well? Yeah, you have, to, <laughs> you have to fish the key out, it seems. It, it it looks like a Tom and Jerry movie now. Okay, I got the key. And now the door should open. Oh, keep on. Yep. Yep, okay. So that's how it works. So this was you finding out how this works with me. This is the first time I'm going through in this mode. Uh, going through the eye scanner again. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> All right, so. Is it muted or not? No, I'm in lost access. Can you hear me? Is it muted? We uh, hear yes, you. of course you can talk. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, I was wondering if I'm muted. So basically what happens is in these systems, there's two laser beams that you have yeah, that try to make sure if you are one person going in the chamber or two. And what happens is there's one laser beam at the top for your body 
and one laser beam at the bottom for your feet. You can only cut the top laser beam once for your body and the bottom one twice for your feet. If you enter the chamber wrongly, it says, no, you're two people. You cannot go in, go out. So that's why you Noemi know, just got kicked out two times now. Uh, is Three it, times is it in the a stick, row. maybe? Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe meanwhile, I can take over and uh, you yeah, can you take, can take over, over once you are in front of the the, uh, the door. <laughs> no problem. So what I'm showing now is basically until now we were we were giving you a naive picture as if we were having one proton colliding in the heart of the detector all the time, which is not the case. It's much more harsh. As you see, each point here is actually uh, different particles that uh, that collide with each, with each other when a bunch of protons from the left and a bunch of protons from the right um, comes together. This is what we call pile up. We are piling up basically collisions. We need to do that because this gives us uh, more uh, collisions at the same time and we can distinguish them. If you see, as you can see, we can uh, see them separately, but it's a challenge for the computing and uh, it, it makes uh, life harder. For the next phase of LHC, it will be even more. Now we have an average of uh, 30, 40 collisions and in, in the upcoming round we will have something like 60, 65 protons colliding at the same time. Okay. Uh, and let's go this up, gives uh, back to inside. Enjoy CMS. You, you you want you want to explain while walking because or I think we I will can explain in a second. It seems like the the CMS is sealed. Yes, we it's are almost ready for the collisions. Mm -hmm. So they are climbing up to the to the top. They will show you the best view yeah. that a <laughs> visitor here cannot see actually. Yep. So. All right, so this is, uh, well, the front end of the CMS experiment. And uh, actually the beam pipe where the particles come in is uh, inside the huge uh, uh, red cylinder. But obviously that's not the beam pipe. The beam pipe is like three centimeters across. Everything around it is uh, basically shielding. So we have this huge uh, uh, orange shielding that when we are in maintenance, we just pull apart and can access the beam pipes. And what you can actually see in front of you, actually in the, between the two orange slices, you see some electronics. These are part of the calorimeters. So of, of what we call the forward calorimeters. So they are basically the detectors that measure particle energy. But the difference is usually the calorimeters are around the collision point to measure the particles as they're coming out. These are actually at the very front of the detector to catch any particles that manage to go forwards or backwards. Because if you have a ring around the detector, you, you will usually have at least a few particles that do not go straight out in the ring. They go either forward or backwards. That's a very good point. And I can add that in front of these detectors that you see in the, in the orange, you don't have a tracker material. So if you want to measure the charge of the particles, you are left with only the signals that comes from the calorimeter itself. You cannot, because you don't have the, the traces of the charged particles. So it's very challenging to include uh, the signals from these detectors into into analysis of uh, of data. I did it for my PhD thesis. That's why I know. So yes, okay, so yeah. Go ahead. I will guess I will hand it back to you and go down to the to the floor level, and I can sure. show you a bit more about the scale. Sure. Maybe in this few picoseconds, I can try to talk about the the, the plan of LHC. As you know, LHC is not running all the time. It's planned to be divided into run periods. Now we are in the so-called third run period. We are we are here basically, uh, and um, we we will have two more years of of data taking interfield with uh, some. Uh, extended uh, end of year shutdowns and then in 2026 we will enter into the phase of long shutdown three where the, the, the accelerator itself will be upgraded to uh, to be able to deliver the the, the collision uh, conditions that i was mentioning 
with higher pileup and with uh, more instantaneous luminosity with more uh, collisions data per second. So it will start in 2029, fingers crossed, uh, if everything goes well and if so there's no no pandemic hitting in the in, in between. Okay. And you it's back to you. On the, in front of the scale. Get the scale. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so we are now on the ground level of the detector. And uh, I guess Naomi can try to get a picture of me to get a sense of the scale <laughs> of how big this thing is. So if I go <laughs> as far back as possible, so yeah. Uh, looking up, it seems quite big to me. <laughs> I mean, to me too. <laughs> so, and uh, the thing is that now, right now, as I say, as uh, Zef mentioned, uh, and I mentioned the control, we are the magnet is not on. We will be commissioning for tomorrow. But uh, well, usually when it's on, if you have a paper clip in here, it's going to start flying. Or if you have a heavy wrench, it's also going to start flying. It's just this kind of magnetic field. But uh, do you have the paper clips? But even if, even though the magnet has been off now since uh, November is, so there is still a relevant magnetic field, or there should be in the uh, in the metal uh, in the metal parts in the uh, yeah in the magnet yoke. So yeah, so imagine this is not a magnet. This is not an earth magnet, and this is not itself an electromagnet. The electromagnet is off. So, but there is still a magnetic field left over. So. <laughs> so even months after you can still do tricks. Yep. Ooh, oh, this this is a nice. <laughs> and even more stronger on the on the tips, right? On the yeah, yeah, on, on the edge. This is stronger. That's edges, why I'm usually yes. putting it. Yeah, but it, it's surprising that it also sticks on the sides like this as well. Maybe after the cycling of today of the magnet that. Uh, yeah, maybe it, it refreshed. But yeah, either way, if if the magnet was actually on, this would be actually flying out. Yeah. So you wouldn't dare, that... dare to have the clips with you if the magnet yeah. was on. <laughs> exactly. Well, it depends on how confident you're feeling. The other thing to mention is that uh, I talked earlier that uh, each of the slices here weighs about a thousand tons, three seven four seven that's worth. So, and uh, you see that the detector is basically a very very tightly sealed together so if you want to do actually any maintenance on it you have to move the slices apart all right how do you actually move uh, three seven to seven jets without any wheels there are no wheels here so that's actually a pretty nifty trick i learned that this could be done when i when i started working here and i, and I learned that this is how it worked so basically you see the orange fits so every slice has at least two or at least four, sorry, orange feet. And what we do is basically just push compressed air down the feet. And the more compressed air you push, this lifts up the, the slices slowly. And it basically just reduces the weight because of the compressed air trying to escape. And then you can just roll it out through the rails, you see. So this is how we move uh, 3747 in 100 meters on the ground. <laughs> like a hovercraft, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> ah, yeah. So, so, yeah, this is the compressed air machine that we use to. <laughs> yeah, ah, the yeah the 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 wires, the cables that we use to pull them out. So, push the compressed air down, then we tie the slices with these wires, and this machine just pulls them up, pulls it back. Yeah, I guess ah, also another thing to say is if you look straight up, there is another big tunnel. And uh, to be to be even more uh, uh, even more far that uh, where uh, Bugra and Zoltan are standing right yeah. now is right above this tunnel. So just a bit, actually a bit to the right of it. But if you go up of this tunnel, take the uh, take the covering off, you're going to see them standing right there on the other side. <laughs> do, do you want me to to knock on the? On the door. <laughs> you, you can knock on the floor, but I don't think you, we will hear. You will not hear it. it itself, <laughs> it's a few meters thick and uh, 90 meters of, of air. So yeah. I, 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 sh I should knock really hard to get you hear that. So this is how you brought the CMS down in the first place. Exactly. Yeah, That's so the shaft. Yeah. 
it must have been a, a huge project for civil engineers. It's quite impressive. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, be before our timelines, both for me and for Nico. Maybe Zoltan can. Yeah, so it was indeed a big project. I'm old enough yeah. to be here then, yes. Not, not to imply that you are old, but you are experienced and you were there in the beginning. So would you, yeah, yeah maybe behind these yellow doors, you can store some of the detectors when you need to open the uh, the slices. As Nikos already said, uh, the slices are easily movable. So in basically a few days, we can reach to the heart of the detector. But you need to first take out what what what's, what is be behind this red, uh, uh, the last red shielding that sits on this yellow feet, uh, the forward calorimeter, as Nico was already saying. And uh, it has a hangar on both sides. so they can they can be put into these uh, rooms uh, which gives us the room and the feet are coming upstairs right when when we open the feet of the hf are brought up to to the surface before being able to move the uh, the slide but yep. that's that's one of the biggest advantages of cms uh, is that uh, we can access to the inside like last year we had a, an issue with uh, with uh, with the cooling systems of the calorimeter and at the end of the year, in 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 a couple of weeks, we could uh, address the point and uh, fix it. So this year we will be back full power. Yeah, also to mention that it's easy to move it is a bit of a misnomer as well. Uh, well, it's easy to it's easy because we have designed systems for it. But if yeah. you're trying to solve this problem as a first time, that's won't be easy and. I mean, even now, if I'm not mistaken, moving moving a few slices is basically a full day's worth of. Uh, no, I, I of, don't mean uh, it's 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 a, it's, a, it's an easy job like uh, everybody yeah. can do it. But uh, think thinking of other experiments, uh, we are we are luckier to reach our yeah. uh, sub detectors. Yeah, exactly. Because we designed it wisely. <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> and I, I guess yeah to, to talk to finally since we're here and we are next to the detector, we can talk a bit about wow. Well, about what the computing uh, processes actually do when you uh, when you get particles. So, well, when you have a computer and you say your computer, I want to draw you a line at 30 degrees on the screen. So the computer takes this line and goes to the screen and says, okay, we, and the screen goes, okay, which pixels do I turn on? Which pixels do I turn off? That's a simple task. So the computer just looks at the line and says, okay, this pixel is in the line, it turns on, pixels outside the line turn off. If you're in the middle of the line, it's a bit more complicated, but you can do like in the middle ground. So it's half on, half off. That's going one way. Now, when you have detectors like this, the output, the data from the detector is also basically pixels. So a particle passes through, it leaves, it leaves pixel traces on the detector. So now you have the opposite problem. You have the pixels, but you need to reconstruct the trajectories. And uh, while for a human, this seems easy, you have a connected dots game. For a computer, this can be a bit more complicated because what if you, are, you have two particles doing an X? Okay, uh, for a human, you say, okay, you have one particle going this way, the other that way. For a computer, uh, it doesn't know if it's a particle going that way and particle that way, or if a particle went this way or this way. You have to actually program it to find out all these rules that we set on how a particles can interact. So the, com the computer systems doing the, the analysis need to know exactly how a particle might behave in order to find out what it stacks where inside the detector. And uh, to close it off is, well, in the introduction, we said that what we're doing basically is uh, studying the fundamental model of physics as we know it. But uh, when you have this much data, you cannot look at five collisions and say, ah, this looks correct. Uh, you need to understand this data and, aggregate and try to see if this data matches your expectation at a huge scale. So what do you do? You can, since you cannot, you cannot look at the data and say this makes sense or not. You cannot automate analysis quite hard. So what we do is, first of all, we take data from the detector and we construct it and we see the particles and see if it makes sense. The second thing we do is we run simulations. So in our computer, we generate particle collisions with how our model of physics says they happen. And we also simulate a model of, this, of CMS. So we simulate collisions 
And then we simulate how these collisions would look like if they happened inside CMS. And then we compare the data. Do they match? Do they not, not match? And this is how we can do a large like statistical comparison with, uh, well, without going through all the collisions and seeing if they make sense. Exactly. That's a good transition to what actually we measure and why, why we do this. Yeah. Maybe I can show quickly. Uh, yeah, I will hand it back to you and we can, I, I yes, guess we'll you can move. around so you can see the rest of the detector right. and then slowly head up. But they cannot see three things at the same time or they can see my <laughs> screen and the, and the camera downstairs. Yep. Uh, well, if they allow it, uh, they could see, but they selected only the, the camera downstairs. But uh, what goes in the recording is fine. So Okay, <laughs> okay that's fine. So basically, as Nico said, what we are trying to sort of understand is the, is the dynamics of the building blocks of the matter. Why, why, why do we need so, so much high energies? With the, with the higher energies, we can probe to to smaller and smaller details of of, uh, of the constituents. What we have is is so-called the standard model. So if I go to Google, if I, I can show my screen or if not, uh, sorry. Yeah, so if I search for standard model, even without saying standard model of particle physics, you see the periodic table of uh, all the <laughs> constituents because standard yeah. model is uh, standard for everything now. Uh, so basically what we see around us is the first family, the up quarks, down quarks that makes the protons and the neutrons and the electrons and some neutrinos and the muons, the heavy brother of the electron that comes from the, from the space. All the others, we built them, of course, the gluons, we should not forget that sort of glues the, the quarks in, in the, in the hadrons, the protons and the, and the, the neutrons and the photon, obviously for light. All the others, of course, the weak bosons we have because of the nuclear decays. And finally, the Higgs boson that was discovered uh, in 2012 in this machine with this experiment that you see uh, is, is also a part of, uh, of our known uh, picture and it completes the standard model. But of course, we know that standard model is not enough to explain it. We have uh, uh, missing, one of the fundamental forces is missing here, which is the, the gravity and it's hard to inclu include it in, in the model. Uh, and we can s sort of probe it, not directly because the energy of the LHC is, is far lower than, than the scale you would need to, to observe the direct effects of gravity, but uh, you can still have uh, effects coming uh, in, in second order. And that's basically what you see. Uh, as Nick already said, we also do the simulation because we know the, the constituents, we have a model of, I mean, standard model that, that allows us to, to know how they interact. So we can uh, also simulate the, the signal. So if I search for a Higgs boson, it will give me some fancy uh, distributions and also the, the famous discovery one. So this is the signal of two photons, like two lights that is coming from, from the collisions. And here, the little bump that you see is beyond the expectation of everything but the Higgs. And so you can, by looking at this graph, you can say that, voila, it's there. That's, that's the Higgs boson. That was a big moment in history. Exactly, in 2012. And I was here. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think, in fact, it took a while to, to cross the information between scientists and uh, in different parts of the world to confirm that this was indeed the kind of measurement that you wanted to see. Exactly. This was one of the, I mean, this this was the initial goal of LHC. Of course, it, it has still other goals, like to find the hints for beyond the standard model. But we are in the process of collecting more data. As Nico said, we need more statistics because... Uh, here we are not talking about deterministic events. We have probabilities, and with uh, we can, if we want to probe to processes that are really rare, we need more and more and more statistics. So that's why we have actually planned until end of 2038 for LHC to continue, at least. 
we do have quite a few questions coming in, by the way. That's what I wanted to ask, actually, yes. Uh, I just didn't nice. mean to interrupt here. I understand there's quite a, a short timeline, so we, we, we're going to keep the questions for the ending. Um, Please one of the questions has been, so um, we can we can see that there have been massive, massive implications of this uh, discovery to the history of physics and um, um People are, have asked, so what are the potential implications of CERN's research to society? Oh, so the, the, the impact of Higgs boson to society, I cannot tell. Sorry. Uh, neither Zoltan can tell it, probably. To, yeah. Well, well, to CERN in yeah. general, overall, the research that uh, yeah. is being contributed. Yeah, what yeah, we well, used yeah. to say that uh, the bread will not be cheaper than. Uh, that's that's uh, the very first thing we could say. But also we could we could uh, just bring historical uh, um, things. Uh, so you remember at least I mean you learned. Sorry, you didn't remember. You uh, you you learned that the ancient uh, uh, Greeks uh, used the <laughs> used the 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 fur of the cat and also the these uh these crystals and also they they saw that uh, the paper is attracted etc and if you would have posed the question then uh to the to the ancient greeks they they wouldn't have any answer on that and they would have not even think of uh, we are going to have mobile phones and uh, we are going to have a, a nice zoom connection today um also if uh, if we 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 think of something much closer when uh, Albert Einstein uh, uh, discovered the uh, uh, general relativity in uh, 1913, I think, if I'm not completely wrong, uh, nobody was thinking of the GPS satellites and the, the correction to the GPS uh, data that is uh, inevitable today for, for our everyday life. So, so as Bugra said, that we can't say anything about the Higgs boson yet, but... Uh, uh, we have a strong belief that uh, if you ask this question in in 200 years from now, uh, we would have a completely different answer. Unfortunately, yeah. the lifetime of a human being is shorter than than this. So. <laughs> Biology yeah, and if... medicine is developing as well. Yeah, yeah but yeah. <laughs> right. If I may, we have hopes. Yeah. We are if still I may alive. add as well. Sure. So... Well, first of all, true that the Higgs boson mm -hmm. will not change our lives. Probably not now. Not in the near future at least but uh, well the thing about CERN is that we're a research organization we do not uh, we don't develop technologies or sell, sell you things so all we're interested in is knowledge for the sake of knowledge as we say or physics research however though when you do physics this year physics research at this scale you tend to push a few boundaries that uh, other people have not pushed yet uh, the boundary, one of the big boundaries yes. that we pushed back in the 80s was the World Wide Web. So at some point we were like, okay, getting physicists uh, in the same point to a conference every year in order to share our new discoveries was getting a bit hectic and expensive. So Tim Berners-Lee came up, okay, why don't we have a World Wide Web where we link our information there? And that's how the internet started. Companies that took it over and you have what you see today. Exactly. Uh, other examples. CERN has been doing particle accelerators since the beginning. From particle accelerator technology, we have, we have made things like, uh, you probably for sure have heard of it, the proton emission therapy in, in hospitals, PET, PET scans. So this is based on particle accelerator technology. So we have pushed a lot of, uh, let's say, a lot of frontiers forward from medical technology to, uh, to actual like digital technology and so on. So yeah, that's what I had to add. Thanks a lot, Nico. That's 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 true. Uh, so because we are pushing the technology to develop the cutting edge stuff for us, because what we use now were not available twenty years ago. There, they had to really do an R and D uh, and to to provide us the, the technology, and we developed the technology that we used. And now it's as a byproduct. It it goes to the to the industry and also to health or to aerospace. It has a lot of uh, use cases. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much. I guess it always starts with a question. It is a little bit of a philosophical one. And then uh, right. in the process and with uh, with a lot of patience and, uh, and I suppose it takes a lot of um, determination 
to get exactly. to that answer of something that uh, I mean in the past it was uh, um, scientific science fiction. Now it is um, now it's reality. Now we have it in proof. Exactly. Um, now um, taking taking on to another concept that at the moment has not been entirely um, understood. Um, we have had another question regarding antimatter. So what do we know about antimatter so far? We are aware, of course, you have the antimatter factory and one of your facilities at CERN. Well, antimatter, we have it, right? When when we have the collisions, we have almost equal matter to antimatter. That almost plays the crucial role that we exist now. If it, if it was completely equal in, in the very beginning, the universe would have been dis disappeared. It will have uh, emerged into the matter would have merged into antimatter and there would, would have been no uh, no us nothing uh, also at LHC we, we, we do produce uh, antiparticles they, they, in this standard model picture that I showed you there is a reflection of it which 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 is uh, the the anti brothers of, of of the same particles like for the electron we have the positron etc and as you say in the antimatter factory or the um, several experiments they they can produce uh, an anti-hydrogen atom and they can make it live for, for several milliseconds, I believe, uh, that allows us that allows them to uh, to study the uh, the phase transitions of uh, of the uh, of, of the anti-hydrogen atom and to look if, if it behaves as as the hydrogen atom that also provides valuable in input to our understanding of physics. Yeah, so just uh, uh, on a different topic, since we are here in front of the poster, is uh, okay, in uh, the LHC, we're accelerating mostly protons. Where do you get protons? Uh, the obvious answer is obviously hydrogen, because one electron and a proton, remove the electron, you're left with a proton. So this entire 27 kilometer ring of the LHC begins at a small hydrogen bottle that we just Turn on the valve and it flows through this device. It's called Duoplasmatron, if my memory serves me correctly, which basically is just an electric field applied through it and it strips the, the electrons from the protons and the protons go through to this big machine, which is the linear accelerator. You saw an accelerating cavity in the beginning. This is pretty similar as well. So it all starts from a bo small bottle of yeah, hydrogen. Uh, yeah. And, uh, while this is not the real LHC tunnel, you can uh, see uh, the scale, kind of. I'm pretty <laughs> sure this is one-to-one -one scale. So yeah, uh, this is actually part of the visit path. So if you ever come and visit, you can get a nice picture hugging the <laughs> LHC. <laughs> I have thousands of those pictures in my Facebook account. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So for how long is the CMS going to be accessible for visitors? At least for the rest of the year, it sounds like it is now closed. So it is now yeah. closed, yes. After November, yeah, so, I would say, naively. Yeah, so since the LHC is running now... But only in uh, the cavern, the, the experimental cavern. The service yeah, the cavern can be visited. Yeah, exactly, all the time. Uh, so exactly. the, the place uh, that yeah. Nico is, you can always go. Yeah, the, the thing, the six city, we're the only experiment at CERN in the LHC that allows visitors when the LHC is running. And that's because we have a separate cavern. So this cavern is completely isolated from the experimental cavern. So even if you come here anytime, you can probably visit this cavern. Uh, but since the LHC is running in, as we said, three years tank, and we usually stop a couple of months around Christmas for uh, maintenance. So while it's running, you can only go here. If you come either during the maintenance stop, you can go in the, in the experimental cavern. And if you want to be very sure that you're gonna go in the experimental cavern, you should come back around uh, 2025 when we next shut down the LHC. Yeah, we saw earlier from the schedule, it seems like there will be a long pause. Yes. Um, yeah. Is that for and, a big upgrade? Uh, yes, exactly. And uh, during each of these long shutdowns, there is a big event, the CERN Open Days, that happened yeah. two times now. And uh, hopefully the third one will happen. And I'm not promising anything on, on behalf of the management, but uh, uh, that's uh, <laughs> Zoltan is closing his mouth not to say anything. Hopefully it will happen, and it's a big event. And uh, you, we had thousands of people coming in two days into CMS and uh, yeah. walk through the path that uh, sort of Nico was Nikos was working was walking, yeah. not not only limited to the usual uh, visit pattern. Yeah, just just to say that on, during the visit days you might really want to come because 
first of all, you can visit outside the visit path, so all around the detector. And, and also the LHC. All, yeah, you can, second of all, you can visit every point at uh, CERN, meaning you can go in the LHC tunnel, go to the, accelerate, to, the particle, to the accelerating cavities, as we say, and so on. So basically, everywhere where visitors don't go, you can go during the visit days, the open days, sorry. But again, nothing we'll promised that it will happen. Yeah. We will note the dates. Um, yeah, you mark the dates, basically. Um, Nikos, you mentioned before that even while the the LHC is running, it is still possible to visit this particular cavity because um, yeah. of the conditions. Um, so I imagine there will be a quite high magnetic field and a lot of um, radiation. So how do you protect yourselves from radio energy? So th this cavern is actually completely shielded from radiation. So we don't really get any in here. And uh, magnetic field, you can actually, when the magnet is on, you can feel it in this cavern. If you hold some paper clips, they will start going mm -hmm. to the side. So yeah, if you come here while the LHC is running and the magnet is off, while you, with the magnet is on, sorry, while you won't be go, able to go in the experiment itself, you will be able to have some fun with magnetic fields while you're down here. So yeah. <laughs> Which okay. is something like 100 times the, the magnetic field of yes. the, the Earth at the closest point. So it's fun to see the clips uh, sticking to the metals and uh, pointing towards the the north of uh, of the CMS magnet. We just had another question coming through. Uh, so this one's about the challenges. So what are the challenges associating with operating uh, and maintaining a complex scientific experiment like the CMS? I suppose this is more directed to operations and to maintenance well, and kind of challenges that may come up during its operation. I mean, yes, it's it's difficult, right? I mean, it's it's a collaboration of 5,000 people and that's why we need these this many people because you have to arrange uh, a lot of stuff. You have to have a shift crew that that Nikos was, was showing you in, in the control room 24 seven to make sure that everything is working fine. There is uh, at least four times bigger team also available 24 7 for each of the sub detectors to make sure that things are fine for for each part of, of of this huge machine and also behind that we have to make sure that the data quality is fine what we are recording is uh, is is good for physics and there is a huge team uh, like uh, nikos is working on the computing side to make sure that uh, the flow is fine we are digesting the data we are taking uh, we are storing them properly in the sites uh, through the the grid system to to all the sites uh, in the world, including including UK obviously, and uh, it's 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 a major business and it's it's tough it's tiring so it's uh, after uh, nine months uh, everybody are, are exhausted and the Christmas break is is well deserved. <laughs> so and, uh, so it sounds like it, it takes great efforts to to be monitoring the experiment all throughout mm -hmm. and you you really can encounter all sorts of challenges uh, can you give us an example of uh, some sort of technical challenge or an operational challenge that has come about during uh, cms's operation i mean anything that you can imagine like we had an incident of magnetic field uh, not not being able to be created because of a problem of the cold cooling of the magnet you can have issues with uh, with some of the sub sectors that i was telling a part of the calorimeter was had to had to be turned off middle of last year because of a leak in the cooling system mm -hmm. you have unexpected stuff i mean you can even have a weasel coming down and eating the cables and uh, stopping the operation of lhc uh, <laughs> and i'm not kidding well, not just the lhc but it shut down the full cern yeah exactly <laughs> yes i mean you have expected stuff and you are prepared for them but you have also unexpected stuff that uh, that you have to solve promptly that's why that's why there are uh, a lot of uh, managers around and a lot of uh, uh, people in, in, the, in the control room, basically, to make sure that it's, it's, it's all fine. So, Nico, it's you. Yes. Uh, Show us some, some detector magic. Let me find the calorimeter. Uh, forward. Okay, so you, this is actually a cutout of the CMS detector, as you were saying it, albeit obviously in a much, much smaller scale. So... As uh, my colleague mentioned, it's basically an onion. So you start from the very inside where you have the tracking system that tracks particle trajectories. 
and as well the outer ballasts for the same thing. Then you have the calorimeters. As we said, calorimeters measure particle energy as they pass through them. And uh, remember that I told you that you could see the very at the very very front the calorimeters that pass that attract any particles that went through the uh, forward through the pipe. And this is this system. So you are seeing basically the in the gap between the two red slices. And uh, some other detectors, for example, we have is this is the muon system. This detects. Uh, some particles are called muons as they pass through. And I guess the big uh, star of the uh, of uh, CMS is the superconductive magnet that generates the magnetic field in order to try to, well, we're trying to calculate the particle momentum using the magnetic field. Uh, some examples, let's say, so if we have, I, I guess the most iconic example is a muon. So a muon can pass through all of the detectors and we can catch it uh, and see it at the muon system at the very end. Uh, some other examples, for example, an electron, you can see it in, a, in the tracking system and in the calorimeter. Uh, photon, right? a photon you can, so the tracking system only shows charged particles. An electron is charged, so we see it's tracked in the tracking system and then a trace in the calorimeter. A photon has no charge, so we only see it in the calorimeter, meaning that if we have two particles, we can, Differentiate between a photon and an electron, depending but, on if we see a track on it or not. Nico, may I jump in? Sorry. Yes. Uh, when you when you click on photon, you see still some some light in the tracker. Do you know what why it yeah. happens? Uh, I'm not a physicist, so I cannot comment exactly on that. That's why it's, I'm the computing side. It's probably due to the pair production of a photon that can happen. Ah, so nice. a photon can traversing the material of the tracker can create a, a pair of electron and uh, and a positron and an anti-electron. Yeah, which uh, which is uh, which can then create a signal as yeah. a yeah, and th this is for electrons and photons. The same thing happens though with hadrons. Hadrons, aka say protons and neutrons. So if it's a charged hadron, say proton, we see it in the in the tracker, then we see it in the calorim in the electromagnetic calorimeter and in the hadronic calorimeter. And if it's a neutral particle, say a neutron, we only see it in the calorimeters in the same principle. Very nice, thank you. I don't even have any questions. To, to second what uh, what Nico Nico's already said, here is a resume of uh, how we how we see the particles as uh, he nicely explained the photon that goes a straight line and ends in the calorimeter, a neutral hadron like a neutron that ends in the hadronic calorimeter, and uh, an electron a, a, a proton for instance a charged hadron and an electron, and finally a muon. So what you see is is these little signals that you trace back and you run algorithms to, to be able to yeah. trace it back all the way down to the to the yeah. interaction point. Yeah, exactly. If you remember what you get out of the inner tracker, so what you Millions get out of, of, the, channels. Of, of, the, of the inside tracker is you don't get like a, a, a vector of a particle went uh, this way in turn 30 degrees, you get just pixels as we call them tunnels. So you have to actually do all the calculations of, okay, where did this particle go? And if you want to find out what type of particle it is, then you have to connect these tracks with what you see on the calorimeters. So you have to measure this track precisely enough to say, okay, if I see this trace on the calorimeter connects to this track, so it's probably a charged particle. If I see no track close by, then it's probably a non-charged particle and so on. Amazing. So Nico, you're you're going to show the LHC uh, model uh, of the dipole I, magnet. I guess yeah. We, as a okay. final stop, we can right. stop That's at the answer. LHC dipole magnet. So, all right. So in the CMS we do collisions, but uh, we have this year to show our visitors as well as how okay how do we make the collisions happen. We you know you saw in the beginning how we accelerate particles, but in order to make them actually go in a circle, you need uh, well, you need something to provide a centripetal force in order to make something spin in a circle. And how we do this is basically magnetic fields. So we have two magnet poles, one down and up. And uh, if you remember your uh, left hand roll, Lorentz force, this means that, 
particle goes one way, magnetic field fade up, Lorentz force that way. So doing this two times with opposite magnetic fields, because you see we have two pipes. One pipe goes one way, the other goes the other way. So in order to have them go the opposite way, you also need to swap the polarity on the magnetic field. So the force is the same. And uh, the special thing about those magnets is you probably heard they are superconductive, meaning they have to be cooled at uh, minus 270 is degrees Celsius. And uh, how we do that is uh, okay, quite complicated, but uh, the coolest thing that we use to cool them this far is uh, liquid helium. You probably know gas helium, you uh, but you haven't heard that it can actually have a liquid form. And uh, that's because the boiling point of helium is minus 269 and something degrees. So it's really, really hard to get liquid helium and make it stay as a liquid. And it's a super, so super liquid. Uh, sorry, so, sorry uh, go ahead. I was just saying that must add so much to the complexity of, of transporting these, these gases and making sure that you, you have all this supply um, at a constant rate and uh, that you, you store it and maintain it at the right way. I mean, it gives us a full picture of how many other things you need to consider apart from just the science. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, Zephi and, uh, and the others as well can confirm it. When you're walking outside, you just see like a big uh, canister and it says, oh, liquid helium, like, totally normal, a big bag of liquid helium next to me. <laughs> so, yeah. You had it on top of the CMS detector as well for the magnet. Yeah, the, the CMS the CMS magnet. I do not know too much about it, but it's also superconductive, and right. it's uh, it's also it's a, a lot of, hotter. It's, it's also stronger than the uh, LHC magnet. You can take over if you want. Uh, in in terms of volume, yes, it's it's stronger in the sense that it's the biggest magnet that, that we have ever, ever, ever built. But the field is is uh, is half the LHC magnet. It's for Tesla, whereas these guys are. Uh, eight Tesla, and we have now I think ones that are capable of 12 12 ish Tesla for the for the for future accelerators. And uh, yeah, as, as Nikos, Nikos already said, it's by liquid helium, and this liquid helium is not a simple liquid, it's super fluent, which means there is no viscosity, so it would really sneak into every corner of, of the point that, that it, it flows, and there will be no gap. Which may, which makes sure that all the the magnet volume is cooled to 1.9 ish Kelvin, which is cooler than outer universe actually. So if you if you if you say that LHC is the coolest point in universe, that's absolutely true. But actually, what is very <laughs> very strange that uh, LHC is almost the 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 highest temperature point in the known universe as well. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> what yeah. the, so so if 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 uh, you would think that. Uh, between the coldest and the hottest spot in the universe, you would have billions of light years uh, space difference. No, you have 50 meters. Exactly. <laughs> From the last magnet to, to the heart of the, the interaction point, basically. Yeah, you can also count it to the heart of the CMS magnet, which is even shorter. Yeah, but CMS is not is not colder than outer universe. It's at 5 oh. Kelvin-ish, so... Uh, uh. It doesn't win the game. <laughs> <laughs> so you will show some detector material there, or you're coming back? Uh, the screens are off here, sadly. And actually, can we? Maybe this? you can show uh, some prototypes uh, of uh, uh, no. silicon detectors yeah. because ah, uh, uh, okay. we have some expertise in room. I, I see from from UK side also on tracker detectors. Ah, perfect. All right, so we managed to turn it on. So this is one of the silicon trackers, which is at the very, very heart of CMS detector, trying to detect traces. And if you can see at the bottom, this is how it looks when you look at it with a naked eye. And uh, then you put it under a microscope and you see basically all the pixels. So this, every single one of this is an individual pixel that detects a particle that goes through it. And uh, on the big scale, if you want to see it as a, there, yeah, perfect. That, that was a pixel detector. And now you yeah. are showing uh, the, 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 the linear ones, yeah. the, yeah, the, the slips. Yeah. The slips. 
So you can you can maybe see the very tiny connections between the front end electronics and the detectors. They're wire bonded one by one uh, by a patient uh, operator, obviously. And you can see the, the front end uh, electronics, the chips that uh, takes the very first data and sends it through the the, the, the cables to, to the backend. As well as, I guess, the final thing in this room that is quite interesting to see is the superconductive cables in the very heart. So in the very heart of this uh, aluminum, I'm pretty sure, metal, you have the superconductive cables that carry the current for the magnet. Niobium titanium, to be precise yes. in the material. Niob and it's aluminum around it. Yeah, so it's to, uh, the... to help for. Yeah, so the metal around is aluminum, and in the heart of it, the cables are made from niobium titanium, which is the superconductive metal. And right. as you might see, that uh, it is two different uh, types of aluminum. Uh, you you see a little bit of a different shining on the the aluminum. The internal part is uh, is helping in in case of a quench, so that uh, acts as a conductor, while the external part uh, acts more like a mechanical stabilizer. So right. this is this is a very actually this is also a marvel of the the technology. How can we uh, how can we avoid of uh, blasted off to the moon if the the magnet starts to quench? Please don't forget that we have two point two gigajoule stored in this magnet once it is energized. So, so this can this can melt how many tons of gold? That I don't know, but this it's, is somehow uh, the kinetic energy of a Boeing uh, 747 yeah. and the, the capability of, uh, of a terraforming capability of a Boeing 747, we all know. Exactly. We have seen it in 2001. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that, just as a frame of reference, a number I hear frequently is that when the LHC is running at full power, it consumes about 40% the electricity of Geneva. So you can imagine the scale of electricity that goes into running pretty yes. much everything in this lab. mainly for cooling yeah. and also for the magnets. Yeah. yeah but this is this is only something like 200 megawatts so we don't need to think that this is an extremely large amount of energy no, no. with respect to the to the uh, to the scientific uh, achievement we can make i think this is a price we can pay yeah. this is this should be <laughs> say affordable yes uh, you say 40 percent of geneva energy but geneva is a small town so yeah. <laughs> And you, you can show maybe the, the muon chambers. Ah, yeah. Okay, let's... That's the final, the huge... Uh... So, yeah, I'm not too familiar with the muon chambers, so you can explain, uh, yeah, if you want the nitty details of how it works. Now, saying that, I don't even remember which of those <laughs> it was. This is the CSC <laughs> from the, the end CSC, cap. Okay. So mm -hmm. what you see is the cutout strips. Actually, these two holes are not in the operational chambers i think it was just a test uh, something but uh, you can see that uh, this is a honeycomb structure that holds these uh, cathode strips uh, this chamber is able to tell the the uh, how the where the muon went through exactly. these are extremely important because they are in the 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 forward uh, direction and the forward physics is is something that determines our our achievements today. Absolutely. And uh, you see also the electronics that uh... actually we have six layers of the of these the cathode CSC. strips in the yeah. CSCs. I think it is evident that every single part and component with this, this ex within these experiments is highly sophisticated. And, and, it will, so. and it will become even more sophisticated uh, as time goes. Like for phase two, all the tracker will be changed. All the end cap uh, calorimeters will be changed to cope with the harsher conditions. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it's a developing machine. It's not, uh, it's not the same CMS that was built uh, in 2008. And it will not be the same uh, in uh, 2027, which makes it fun to work here. So now they're on, on their way to to meet us in this room. Few steps left. <laughs> Hello, where are you joining? I can already oh, see you. you and voila. <laughs> 
So any questions from your side? Please uh, don't hesitate. Um, we had a couple coming through that you uh, answered and we answered throughout the conversation. Yeah, hello. Um, hello, it's great to see you together again. Thank you so, so much for this thorough okay. tour. Um, I think one of the, the questions I had repeating uh, a few times here um, is um, regarding the university level uh, of knowledge for people that are quite passionate about CERN and uh, quite keen on joining you one day. I think we have quite a few people in the room who look up to you and to the engineers at CERN doing this incredible research and development and work. So what would you, can you recommend any specific resources, programs, skills that um, we could look into uh, from a university point of view yeah. to build these skills um, to then be able to join Many, the CERN many day. opportunities, yes. You, you can go to the CERN homepage and search for opportunities and you will see many. For the students, we have the famous summer, summer student program that happens all the time. Even for the high schools, we have uh, programs that uh, they can propose a detector and they can come for uh, for testing it in, in, in Beamline, like Beamline for schools. It also mm -hmm. happens here and also at, at DAISY, the German uh, uh, laboratory for, for particle physics. Uh, there are many more. There are technical uh, fellowship programs, uh, technical studentship programs, and many more that I don't even know. Maybe the, the younger generations, you have been here. Nico is, is also uh, much younger than me, and he can uh, also provide some some insight to it. But enormous opportunities if you are interested, and uh, uh, it, it will be great to have you, of course, uh, of course here. Uh, a follow-up question to that. Thank you very much. Can you recommend any specific software tools that uh, students can look into learning in order to be successful at CERN? I mean, it's hard to say, right? In the beginning, people came with, with the knowledge of Fortran. And mm -hmm. uh, we, we learned C++, we learned uh, Python. We, people are using much more sophisticated tools. Uh, these guys are using... Uh, uh, super nice database tools or whatever uh, that helps us uh, do what what we need to do, and maybe Nico can can take this uh, better as a as a computing scientist. Yeah, so I cannot uh, talk a bit talk a lot about the physics side of the software. I know we use okay, we use root. It's a uh, standard in physics, but I don't really know what the physicists use. But for those of you that are interested in computing, well, the first thing you need to know is programming. For what language, it doesn't really matter. If you know programming, we trust that you can learn any language in uh, a couple of months that Absolutely. it takes you to get trained here. And other than that, if you're interested in doing computing, I think the best thing you can learn in order to have a better chance to make it here is, uh, well, Linux. So Linux is the operating system that runs pretty much the entirety of CERN. So control systems in the detector, uh, data center, any single computer that you can think of, it runs Linux. So if you know your way around Linux, you probably have a pretty good chance of making it either a turn or pretty much anywhere that does a lot of computing. Absolutely. And Fantastic. the physicists so have, to, have to know it as well. <laughs> yeah, that does cover it in terms of computing side. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Do we have any more questions? We can have one more. Today? If you like, a uh, few, few more. Even we have time. Um, do you recommend any activities to do uh, to get another chance to get into the short and for summer? Did this come through? No. Can you please repeat? So, could you recommend any activities uh, that students could take up in order to have a better chance at joining the studentship? Answer. Well, I, again, to Nico, I would say. Oh, that's a very on-topic question because I'm currently, I, I, well, I'm in the process of looking at CVs for summer student. Zef is quite aware. So, well, if I'm looking at the computing summer student, what I'm looking for is interest in computing or physics or passion in general outside of the work you do in the university. Meaning, if you are looking in computer science, you can do some projects by yourself by just what interests you. Or go on uh, GitHub, for example, search a project that you like and write some code for it. This is a very good like indication that you are interested in computing in general and not just to get your degree and you are 
passionate enough to go and search for things you like and improve them. That's step one. That's all well, part one. Another thing that uh, that is looks very very good is if you have like your own. If you're cooperating with a professor to do research at your university, so look up your professors, look at their researches, and go to them like, okay, uh, can I help? I'm interested in this, and this also looks very very good that you are interested enough to go above your lectures and do some research by yourself. That basically explains the the path to enter enter CERN. Thank and you. And please don't forget the technical studentship as well, which uh, which uh, lasts uh, uh, a little bit longer than than the than the summer studentship, and also and also we have doctoral uh, uh, programs, we have uh, fellowship programs after that. So so that's a that's a big variety of. Uh, of possibilities to come here and as uh, as our guides just said today that we need all sort of engineers and physicists this is not just a physicist world we need uh, uh, it people we need uh, electronics engineers we also need civil engineers and of course mechanical engineers so definitely we can absorb all sort of of people who are interested in physics and technology there is a job opening for an environmental engineer just to just to give you an insight of <laughs> the, the broad uh, yeah so if you go to smartrecruiters.com slash cern you would see all the available positions and you can search and in, in google as well that would lead you to to the opportunities yeah just to say that the positions you see are basically specific positions but for the programs that we mentioned so summer students technical students and fellows it's a bit different. So what you do is you send your CV to the summer student pool and your CV goes basically in Zion database. And then you have all the supervisors from CERN looking at those CVs and deciding like, okay, this is the person I want to hire. So while the, the, the jobs you're looking for are basically the high level, like specific job postings for our programs, you, all you have to do is basically design your CV in a way that matches what you're interested in. And then if there is an opposition for that, the supervisor will contact you at the end of the period right but there is a period of application that you, that you should still follow so if you look for summer student program as as nico already said you can you can find it and it will be nice to work with you here thank you i think this is all for questions from our end um it's been an absolute pleasure having you today thank you so much for hosting us at cern and i hope That's... you've all enjoyed these fascinating insights that's uh, that's our pleasure to have have you here and basically i did nothing it was nikos walking around and i was and standing here thank you enough thank you for, very much for taking the time and fitting us into the schedule mm -hmm. especially being one of the last uh, tours it's for this season pleasure. nico maybe the sunglasses yeah uh, no problem as well thank you to zoltan and noemi who's somewhere behind so zoltan doing the technical work for the stream and noemi doing the camera work for when we're in the tunnel it was our pleasure to to participate this visit today. Uh, thank you very much for coming and visit us. Amazing. And we hope one day that we can come and visit in person. Yes, sure. <laughs> Looking forward. Perfect. We wish you luck with everything else that you do and the amazing work and research that you're doing at CERN. We look up to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Ciao, ciao. Take care. Thank you. Bye then. Bye.